everyone. <laughs> so uh, I'm so glad to uh, see all of you today here. Uh, so we today have two talks. Uh, now next talk. Uh, the talk is uh, from Radislav Maldavan, uh, organizer of Luxembourg Jazz as well. And uh, he's talk about Angular and Kubernetes deployment. So also like some hard topic, I think. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, do we have any full stack developers here? So I think it's maybe more, more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, at my also projects at my work, usually all these things were done by backend developers, then DevOps guys. And uh, yes, it's very cool when you front end and you know all this kitchen as well. I think it's really uh, level up. So uh, I, I can speak more. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, after this uh, talk, we will have pizza, as far as I know. Yeah, so you can drink if you're thirsty. Yeah. yeah. So you're ready? No? No, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, super. Okay, you're welcome. Ready, Slav. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Rodislav, and I'm um, I'm uh, officially uh, my official title today is a software craftsman. So I'm doing lots of craftsmanship, and I. I really love to code, uh, let's put it this way. Not just to code, but to code uh, in a nice way to be proud in front of my daughters, basically. Uh, even though they uh, really have no no desire to do IT whatsoever. I tried, and never works. So we'll keep it on YouTube. <laughs> Hopefully some other daughters will do that. So uh, today we are going to talk about front-end uh, GS applications in Kubernetes. And particularly, we are going to do a Angular example. Um, okay, let's start. Uh, I have some animations. I'm not really good with animations. Uh, however, um, I was good back in the days, in back in 2007 when I was doing Flash. I don't know if you are uh, young enough to know what's Flash. And um, uh, we'll have some uh, animations if ever. Uh, hopefully, you don't have issues with that. So in the agenda of the day, we'll have we'll quickly speak about what's Kubernetes because I'm not sure everybody knows what's that. If you know, cool. You'll uh, look for uh, you'll see some uh, f uh, funky animations, and for everyone else, um, you'll learn something at hopefully, and uh, we'll talk about why deploying on Kubernetes can be handy, and we'll do a demo. Uh, after that QA, if ever there are some questions, and we'll. Um, show you our uh, Luxembourg GS Discord uh, QR code channel. So we are starting a Luxembourg GS uh, Discord channel. So everybody who is in, interested about Luxembourg, about JavaScript in general, please uh, feel free to join. The goal of the community is not just to have uh, another dead community. Hopefully, this will be alive. And uh, uh, the goal is to exchange jobs, questions, Hey, did you? I'm thinking to go uh, to work at uh, Sphere, for example. Do you have any feedbacks? So we can do that. Um, Luxembourg GS and yeah, Discord. Okay, so let's let's jump into the question, into the into the topic. What is Kubernetes? Shortly, it's K8S. That's because the word Kubernetes has uh, eight uh, letters. That this is the shortcut, the official shortcut. So Kubernetes is a is an orchestrator. Uh, meaning that it can orchestrate, so <laughs> as, uh, as straightforward as, as it can be. Kubernetes can speak YAML language. I don't know if you are familiar with YAML or if you love this language. Obviously not, because there is no such a person. And it's uh, open source, so which is good. It's open source, meaning that you can install it on your machine, and it will be not so simple. Um, it's hard to manage if you don't spe specialize, so usually you won't be installing Kubernetes. Most likely, you'll be using Kubernetes uh, installed by people who know how to install it, or uh, like uh, DevOps teams, or I don't know, system administrators. Or it's very likely that you'll be using Kubernetes uh, managed in the cloud, like uh, Elastic Kubernetes uh, Service, or OVH, or uh, Google, or whatnot. 
So in other words, Kubernetes is an orchestrator who can um, orchestrate the deployment of uh, containers. Here I'm using the Docker uh, logo, but uh, it's not Docker only. Kubernetes can do everything that's called OCI, Open Container Initiative. It just happens that uh, most of people uh, are using Docker to build images, but uh, Kubernetes usually is using other engines to actually run them. So how you do Kubernetes? Uh, you open your computer, you open your terminal, and you have to install the Kubernetes. And how do you install it? There are many ways, but the idea is that you have to install a daemon, a application, on uh, all of your servers, and your, these applications will have to work with each other. So this is, the Kubernetes is not something magic, uh, not something that will install by itself. You have to install it somewhere, and then it will run. And in this way, Kubernetes will create a, a cluster and will be able to uh, uh, treat all of your computers as one entity, almost. But uh, you'll find out eventually if you didn't. It's a sad story, but it's like that. So, um, uh, Kubernetes, how do you deploy something on Kubernetes? Normally, you as a developer or uh, somebody from the DevOps team will be creating a YAML. Uh, as we said before, Kubernetes speaks YAML, so you'll be creating a deployment YAML file. You're going to use a uh, kubectl or kubectl, depending on how you love it. You're going to use a uh, kubectl uh, to deploy this YAML file by using uh, a command line, and then Kubernetes will know will decide on what servers this uh, particular application should be deployed, and it will run it. So how usually it works, how this deployment YAML looks like. Uh, I don't know if the text is readable for you now, but uh, afterwards I will uh, be doing a demo and I will uh, zoom it uh, more. It's a YAML with, uh, it's a manifest YAML with lots of parameters inside. And one of the most uh, important parameters is you, you have to write it, so that's why I wrote IDEA Deployment YAML. Why IDEA? Because I'm using IntelliJ IDEA. It's not popular, but I love driving a Lamborghini one coding, so. Um, I'm using IntelliJ, so that's why I put it. And um, one of the most important things here is the, um, the red thing, uh, the red attribute called image, and that's the application that we are going to deploy today. Um, voila, so when we said when we set an image, that image needs to be built. And how usually do we build it? We have to write what's called a Docker file. This time, hopefully, it's not YAML. We have to write the Docker file by hand. And after that, uh, it will look like uh, a little bit like this. You'll have to uh, build your application and then tell to this uh, Docker file where to take the information from. You'll have to use uh, this kind of um, uh, keywords, I, I forgot the name right now, but it doesn't matter. It's something like commands in uh, in Dockerfile in order to copy when it, whatever you want to build into your uh, into your image. An image, fi finally, it's just a tar gz file. It's a zip file with uh, multi layers. So once you write this Docker file, you are going to use Docker build and Docker push. Docker is uh, is going to build this image and then will push this image by default on uh, hub.docker.com, on Docker Hub essentially. And uh, however, in uh, private uh, companies, usually in banks or any other company, usually you have your own registry. So hub.docker.com will be replaced by hubmycompany.com, and you are going to push your images there. That is most likely. And uh, again. We'll do a comeback. The, once the image is pushed, we can use it to reference it in uh, in deployment YAML, like you see this uh, image uh, image element there. After that, you can use your deployment YAML. The image is going to be deployed somewhere in the, the cluster. Now the question is why this can be handy. Everything that you saw just now, just now, you know, every front end application is code, lots of code. Now, when you want to deploy something. For example, in the old ways, you will have to zip the folder, send it to somebody, that person will unzip it, will put it in Apache HTTP or Nginx or whatnot, and this way the file, the, the thing will be deployed. So more, um, some people with uh, much more energy, they will put in the Git repo directly into HTTP HTML folder of Nginx, and we're doing Git pull uh, straight into the folder. Why not? We live only once. Um, 
today we can do it differently. There are many ways of doing it, of course. We can uh, build files and so on. However, when we speak about Kubernetes, as you saw, everything is a file. So we literally script every single thing that we do in our deployment. We script how, we, how the app works, we script how the app builds, and we script how the app is getting deployed. So everything is as a code. There are absolutely no, uh, no uh, how to put it, uh, surprises, no next, 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 next clicking. Uh, most of the people are using, uh, most of the operating system anyways uh, started to uh, remove the next, next, next thing, so let's go, uh, let's go in the easy, easy, easy way. Now, Kubernetes pro is providing everything. It's creating new sandboxes for prototyping. For example, you can use namespaces in order to isolate your applications. You can use environment variables. And precisely this part is the one that we are going to use mostly today. You can use secrets. Is less important for a front-end application, but you know, if you feel like YOLO, why not? Uh, you can use storage, so you can put already into your application, you can mount a storage folder with pre-built data without the need of compiling your application. So basically your application ca can have some data JSON or whatever. If you don't think that's interesting today, I can tell you that there are side generators like Gatsby, for example, and they rely pretty heavily on data JSON files that allows you to put data and then make this data available for search online. So what you can have in your local development, you can have a small file, but in the, uh, in the remote, you can have a production ready with lots of information and so on. So that's interesting. And again, you don't need to recompile or rebuild anything. It's just a, pl it's a pluggable uh, thing. You can create URLs. You can create URLs that are working only within the cluster, which is not practical. And you can create URLs that works outside of the cluster. And what's interesting with this is that you can create them really instantly. Uh, everything is easy to automate because everything is a file, a less YAML, but you'll find out later that. Um, uh, you can even deploy your feature branch you can completely automate even deployment of feature branches with uh, dedicated URLs and everything will be de automatically deployed with Kubernetes. It's uh, in this way you can give uh, to your uh, stakeholders a preview of what you are working on. And this can be, this is uh, really, really, really quick. In, uh, in the tests, I can give you some numbers here. So a normal enterprise grade application that we do with Angular, uh, pardon, that we do with Angular is uh, taking us five minutes to deploy with the, in this way. Uh, the whole thing from the push till to till the refresh where you do control F5, it takes five minutes. Uh, today it will take around one minute. However, I'll do the, I'll show the demo first and then we'll actually practice it. So just to be on the safe side. You can, uh, if you have advanced service meshes in, um, in Kubernetes with APM support, you'll have uh, distributed tracing out of the box. So, and everything will be in one place. Uh, it's fine, it just works after half a year of trying. Um, so let's go for the demo. Hopefully you are ready, hopefully I'm ready as well. Uh, so where we can start. Yes, I'll, I'll show you first the application. So I have here an application that's running in Kubernetes. As you see, it's running Kubernetes. I have different values. This is a string value, this is a Boolean value, a float number, and an integer, num integer number. That's pretty important because depending on the system that you use and the way you parameterize your things, you can have issues actually putting floating numbers or Booleans because you might have situations with double quotes, interpretation of the file, or interpretation of the values, and just application not working because there is a 2.5 instead of 2. So as you see, everything works fine. And we'll see how exactly this works. So let's go into the code. Uh, can you tell me if the code is readable on your side? Okay, fine. So what I have here, I have a just simple, uh, just one simple uh, Angular 14 application with a couple of files, lots of them. But okay. We have the Docker file that I was taking, uh, that I was saying. We can use a Docker file to a multi-stage Docker file that is building my application and it's actually packaging my application. This is what we are going to do today. And my application does nothing more than... Yes. And then we have the HTML. 
So yeah, my application nothing, nothing, uh, does nothing more than just showing a title and then displaying the values within the front end, just like we saw uh, a bit earlier. So how we do, how, uh, let's start this application and see, see what happens. When I will start, I will say exit presentation mode. And then let's do what's called um, package.json. Where's my package.json? Then I'll say, since I'm using IntelliJ, you know, that. Um, the application will start. And what we'll see in that application, that's that's very ele inter interesting element. Okay. So what we see in this application, we see hello world, true, 314, and then 42. That's the application. And this application, it's equivalent with what is running in Kubernetes. And as you see, there are different values here running. So we see a different string here, potentially the same value here. And then we see different num numeric values. So how is it possible to do that? Uh, some of you might say we can use environments. Uh, yes, we can. However, whenever we are using environments, usually we are building uh, we are building the application then environments uh, values are replaced so we have a final build with everything we have inside here we have exclusively one environment yes that is using you'll never believe this so how exactly this is working um, we are having variables that are passed through window in a dedicated namespace to the window object in a dedicated namespace that i'm calling env and we have values with different values, uh, values of different types. So as you see, we have number for floating and the int. We have a Boolean and we have a string, Noth nothing special. Now, how we can transform, how we can manipulate those values? The manipulation of the values is done in the following way. So we have the assets. We have what we call an uh, environment. And this NVGS, this is a file that is going to hold finally all the values that you'll be using inside your applications. This is the thing that is going to populate your window.env um, namespace. And how we do that? We do it in the following way. We are going to create a uh, env template file.js. This template file will have placeholders, placeholders like you see here placeholders that is, are going to be looked for in the environment and then replaced with the values from that environment. So if there is a variable with this name, it will be put here. If there is no variable of this name, then nothing will be put there. So eventually you'll end up with null or not a value or something. And in order to have the bool, you see we are using parse float, parse int, and parse bool. And that's, that is because Environment variables can be exclusively strings. We cannot have really int or bool or, you know, we don't have a type. Everything is basically a text value. So what we do, we put placeholders here, and now the how the magic happens, what exactly is putting the value inside this, I'll show you right away. Remember that Docker file. So in this Docker file, in this magical thing, let me enable soft wrap. So what we'll do, we'll do the following thing. Hopefully you are familiar with a little bit of shell. So we are going to invoke shell with the command that's called envsubst. We are going to give to this command a template. Mm, this template. And then we are, we are going to tell it, please print the output into the envgs just basically override this file. This file is just a file that does nothing. It's mostly for your local development to avoid having uh, errors because you have no values. And after that, execute nginx as a daemon, as a daemon, and that's it. So what we do, finally, we take our environment. This command is going to go into our environment, look for the values of the variables, apply them to this template, and then output the file into NGS. You can actually override, you can use only one file that's called NGS and put everything inside. I prefer to have one template and one uh, dedicated file. 
because uh, honestly it's just a preference nothing uh, technical behind the idea it's purely a preference now how this is interesting this is interesting in the following way you have only one environment yes you can create uh, objects and uh, parameters as much as you want as complex as you want all of them will work as long as you map them so you have to map them here that's one and you have to map them in another file that's number two so you have to do two mappings the two mappings are not necessarily type safe so you might mess some stuff that's why test exists so you can test uh, all of that and uh, that's the that's the fragile part of this approach However, this approach leaves you with one environment TS, yes. no magic here. Basically, you are always working in production mode, and uh, everything is built as a as a Docker as a as an element. Now, I want to build this application. How do I do that? I'm using in the in this particular case, I'm using um, GitHub, and GitHub has what's called uh, workflows. So the workflows. Are, um, if I'm not mistaken, they are always uh, there as well. Uh, YAML files, yeah, they are YAML. So a workflow is a script of your pipeline of what you want to build. So as you see, in order to build my image, what I have to do, I'm setting up the environment, I'm logging into Docker Hub, I'm building and I'm pushing my image. This particular procedure takes uh, uh, one minute and a half. There is no difference if you'll be doing this in uh, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or any other custom environment that you have. There will be exactly the same, uh, the, ex the execution of things will be exactly the same. Execute, exit presentation mode. And this way we can build the image. Now, in order to deploy that image, we have to write what's called a deployment YAML. So a deployment YAML, it's a manifest that you write and usually you copy paste it afterwards because nobody remembers everything by heart just too much too many things we have lots of details that i'm not going to go into uh, in a deep uh, very deeply i'm going to speak precisely about the containers that you want to deploy and here i'm using a custom image from a private repository on docker hub what i'm using as well I'm using, as you see, environment variables. So my application is running Hello World 42.3.14. The remote application with very important, exactly the same code, is using different variables. Why is this interesting? It's in this interesting precisely for the following cases. You have different environments, dev, test, int, QA, prod, whatever. So what you can do, you can have an env name and specify the environment. And based on this environment, basically you can change the logo, you can change certain colors so that visually you can distinct one environment from another. You can have environment variables for uh, URLs because your application finally will call some backend service. That backend service can change the URL five times a day. There will be literally no difference because five times a day you can change the deployment and your users will never observe that. Um, you can add uh, new values, you can change things. And uh, what's interesting, because the principle is based on environment variables, there are many mechanisms in uh, Kubernetes that can inject environment variables, not just code them like this, but inject based on annotations. When I'm saying, uh, I don't have annotations here, but okay. Based on annotations, and then modify your deployment even further. Uh, right, so let's see how it works. So we'll say hello Kubernetes world. Let's say uh, hello by Borg. This is our sponsor for today. Let's deploy the, the thing. So what, I, what I'm doing right now, I'm redeploying the, just the manifest of the already installed applications that still runs uh, hello Kubernetes world. So if I'm doing a refresh, it's online in Kubernetes in a, in a distributed cluster and we just changed the value. So what's interesting now is that everything is so can be automated. You, dis you deploy it and you instantly get the result. Now the question is, this runs in a dedicated Nginx instance. Is it efficient? Is it uh, 
consuming uh, lots of resources. Well, it consumes, uh, Nginx is pretty quick, so yes, it consumes the one site, one uh, spa per one Nginx. So yes, you'll have to pay for the Nginx resource, which is not that big. However, uh, what not big means, so not big means that you'll start it with at least 64 megabytes of RAM, and uh, 100 milli CPU, meaning that one CPU divided by 10. And uh, if ever your, your application is heavily used, you can go, for example, in this particular case, to one gigabyte and one entire CPU. But in most of cases, honestly, Nginx is that fast that this, this is a production grade in any enterprise for about 2,000, 3,000 users. This Nginx will easily host everything, no problems. This is very, 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 very rich way to give limits to an Nginx. So yes, you have to pay for that. However, you pay for some resources, but you gain, you gain the following. You gain a dedicated URL, which is cool. You gain this. Precisely, connection is secure because it's encrypted via Let's Encrypt. You gain automatically updated certificates out of the box. No surprises, everything works just fine. And what's interesting is that the very same mechanism were for your HTTP, your SPA applications, and for your APIs, like literally for everything. Because on the very same domain, I have a backend application called Who Am I? And this backend application, uh, you don't see clearly the text, it doesn't really matter, it gives me some technical information. So as you see, again, it's the same domain, and connection is secure, but it's completely different application with a completely different setup. So if ever tomorrow, we say, we are going to change this application, uh, and more precisely, we are going to uh, change the, um, the domain for that application. We can do that. And somebody will say, usually the architects, they'll tell you, you can change the domain, but you cannot really renounce to the old domain. So in Kubernetes, we are going to, uh, we are going to describe, next to the deployment YAML, we are going to describe uh, ingress, and this particular ingress object will expose our application to the domain that I just specified. And what I can do, I can say uh, prod, I don't know, and uh, deploy a different domain for the same application, like literally the same application, and just go with it. What I can do as well, I can create a SPA2, and then just create another deployment that has a corresponding name, part two, and uh, it will go, it will uh, just work. Of course, we can change, we have to change all of the references, but as you see, I'm changing references in the files that easily changeable, and I'm changing only small parts of this, like literally one place in this case. It's easy, it can be automated with literally any templating language. You can do it even with Mustache.js if you really want it. Uh, but usually you are not going to do that with Mustache, you're going to do it with Helm. However, Mustache works as well. And um, when you are going to create another host, either you have, you are hosting, you are doing DNS management with Kubernetes and then it's automatically, it's, uh, it takes about 10 minutes for all of the DNS servers out there to learn about you or you have to go in your DNS settings and manually change. So if your DNS provider is manual, then you'll have to do everything manually, which is a sad story, but it's like that. Uh, pay, pay, backend, service, workflow. So let's see, let's see how long it takes to deploy this application. In my application, I'm having the, um, I'm showing the title, Next to the title, we can show, for example, the um, environment, a variable that I still don't have. We can add this variable, no, let's do it differently. Uh, right, so, uh, as you remember, I showed just before, for the strings, in your application, everything will be typed, the power of TypeScript. However, uh, I'll just quickly show you again the thing. In your environment, yes, everything will be typed as well. However, in your template, everything will be treated as a, as a string and you have to type it on your own. You have to know what kind of value you're going to add. So let's go for env. 
I don't remember if I did the right uh, name on the other side, but let me check. So it's env, env, string variable, so this will be env, yeah. As you see, you have auto-completion and it's fine. Again, you don't have to com auto-completion here because it's from environment, but you have auto-completion in, in this uh, nice part. We have env, we have the environment that is going to be deployed. We have, um, we have to give it a default value, no, but uh, not here. We are going to give it a default value in our environment, yes. So default value will be local. All uh, right, so I don't uh, I don't remember to have been changed anything else. Now let's git commit and push. In directory. Big change. And uh, no need to check. I'm certain about my changes. However, I'll check uh, what I just deployed in uh, in my local environment, demo spa local app is running and the title is demo spa. Did I did a refresh? Did I did? Ah, yeah, right, because I put the environment name in here, demo local, yes. Uh, that's why I see it, which is fine. Now let's quickly go to your friend uh, GitHub. And when I'm going to GitHub, I have actions, I have the big change that's uh, being deployed, uh, that's being uh, built and deployed, like literally now. As you see, the action is very simple. We have the build and push, so we are running the npm install, everything that you want. We are basically building the application, but we are not putting anything into that application in terms of configuration, apart from the default values that we have already in our environment, yes. So, when I'm using this method, environment ES is purely for local development, so that any developer can do npm install run. That's it, no surprises. And it works. And when it comes to any other environment, we are going to have a deployment with the right environment variables. Right, so as you see, it takes for now uh, one, two minutes, no, yeah. So. We have a new version in um, 1 minute and 10 seconds. Let's quickly go here and then say refresh. It doesn't, doesn't work. And it doesn't work, why? Because, because in this particular case, I haven't deployed any automatically, any mechanism that automatically deploys on Kubernetes. And that is for a reason, because different people are using different ways. Somebody can use Argo CD or uh, Jenkins or uh, Hook a webhook to deploy that. In this particular case, I'm uh, leaving everything because this demo is oriented for developers. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to redeploy my uh, application with, uh, uh, my, I'm going to redeploy, uh, do my deployment, do a control F5, it doesn't work. So the question is why it doesn't work? It is because whenever you are applying your deployment of already running application, we changed only the image, but we didn't change the manifest deployment manifest. So it doesn't work. What we can do, we can undeploy the application, completely destroy it, which is deleted. The application doesn't work anymore. We can redeploy the application. Uh, well, I created. So as you see, the the installation of an application and installation of new application of a new version it's instant uh, would you uninstall and install uh, in your uh, real life no because in your real life you're going to use versions unlike me in this case and the versions will go here where you'll say v123 because this is the easiest versioning way and you're going to deploy, and every time you do another release, you'll say one, two, three, four, and so on. Or what you can do, you can put here a git commit that will look something like that. So you can create an image for every git commit. You can change the deployment manifest. And you install in your Kubernetes a tool that's called Argo CD. You say to Argo CD, please monitor this particular file. Is, if there is a change, just redeploy the change. And why it's interesting, because in this way, 
you manually can go here and say v123 wait let me let me try v123 from my computer in my uh, development environment punk it says configure it let's go let, let's go and try it so i have something working under all five oh it doesn't work why because this image world does not exist because uh, i haven't created it yet by default everything is pointed to the latest which I'm using right now. So what you're going to do, you're going to keep your deployment tidy. You're going to give it git commits and this way you always have the deployment YAML with the latest version. You can use Argo CD for automatic deployment or manual deployment from your Kubernetes, from your uh, local environment and just test your application, uh, your new application in under in under two minutes, in one minute and, and a bit. Okay, let's say it's slower, let's put it two minutes which is fine because imagine you have a retrospective in 15 minutes and you identify the bug, well, you can fix it in under 15 minutes. With CICD tooling, I'm already fixing that for a long years now. And it works, it works. I actually, that's why I, that's why uh, I arrived in Luxembourg, otherwise it won't be there. CICD helps. So uh, let's go back. Um, so yeah, you, as you see, you can have any any sort of value any types of values, you have to map them. Yes, there is a little bit of work to do, but it's this kind of work that you do once and usually you forget, and then when the bug appears, you have to spend half a day understanding. But yeah, it's um, it's pretty straightforward when in terms of configuration. This particular way gives you what's called pre-baked images. So usually people are saying, in my JavaScript application, I'm not loading the configuration, uh, I'm not putting the configuration environment yes because I'm loading it from a configuration server, which is good, it's a good idea. What is bad, what bad can happen? Well, configuration server might not be reachable. Millions of reasons, HTTP, network, uh, server is down, what not, your application will not work. So, and then you say, yeah, but I can uh, mount a configuration into and override things in my uh, image. Yes, in that case, your deployment YAML will become much more complex here than having just some environment variables changing the things deploying it and you're good to go you can deploy it from your local machine from your CI/CD environment it just works and why is interesting is that as well you can test uh, this particular docker image you can test it locally you can build it locally you can give the source code to somebody who does not have uh, javascript skills and have no node.js on his, her computer. Uh, they will need, though, a uh, Docker runtime, which is usually the case for CI/CD platforms. And they can build the application and run the application, no strings attached. Everything just works. That's why my uh, build pipeline in, uh, pardon, in GitHub has multiple steps, but when you go to the actual thing, it has only one step which can run literally everything. Tests, uh, sonar, uh, check marks, everything you, are, everything you want. You'll have eventually some sort of a user interface to know what, uh, what uh, applications, uh, when applications have been built. You, you can see your, your images, you can run them locally, you can share them with friends because sharing is caring, especially during pandemic. And uh, yeah, you have, uh, Pretty much that's, that's all, that was all for my talk. I'll just uh, wrap up the things that you don't uh, fall asleep. So how it works, basically you are pushing to GitHub your changes, GitHub actions will kick in place and then we'll push the image to Docker Hub. Then you manually or automatically, you apply the deployment YAML through kubectl to Kubernetes and then Kubernetes will pull the image and will run it for you. That's, that's great. And as you see, this particular part can be easily automated because it's a file. So you can automate it because you can edit it. You are going to, you can put it in Git, so you can do Git ops. Uh, you can uh, not put it in Git, but you should not do that. And um, to wrap up, we can deploy upfront ends instantly, not just quickly, but let's, let's be honest, it's instantly. Some, some companies are deploying this in one month. Um, 
in any environment. You can even deploy your uh, dynamically your feature feature branches if you want that. The setup is um, the setup is done through environment variables, and you as well can mount files or folders to override certain of your generated files, like index, for example, HTML, or main CSS to add some extra whatever. It works for both internet and intranet. Uh, I don't know if you worked in any um, big uh, companies. I think at by Borg that should be the case as well. You surely have some intranet applications. So you can deploy things for intranet and for internet, no problems. The deployment is instant. As you saw, everything is CI CDable. So just uh, just does the job. So now um, this is the QI slide. And they put an arrow to not forget about the Discord channel. Uh, do voila! That was my talk. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have questions, you can shoot now, or you can uh, tell. We can discuss afterwards, um, right afterwards, <laughs> with the with a little drink in hand. Um, okay, it's too big. Good. Um, so <laughs> thanks for the talk. Um, uh, so one question in the service uh, when you showed about the resource, right? Because uh, you come from a Java background with very strong Java background. And, it it uh, was that visible? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm wearing glasses, so <laughs> <laughs> makes makes a bit more easy. So the question is, um, how do we get the r right resource allocation? Because if you are basically putting just some random value, you are wasting the resource. If you are putting less you can basically make your application get killed because of uh, out of memory or something like that. How do we get that right um, resource allocation? So from your um, means uh, any best practices or um, what you can share, right? It would be good. Uh, so hi, I, I do it. First of all, I'm, um, I have a certain uh, years of experience, so I know them almost by heart, uh, how much they consume. However, I'm trying to be factual and how I doing personally, I always use tools like Dynatrace, ELK, Datadog, New Relic, whatever, you name it, that is monitoring your, the consumption of what you have there. So I'm checking, I'm deploying applications, I'm giving them something that by, by I is enough or not enough, you know, like approximate uh, variable. And as you saw, the deployment YAML is just a text file. It's very easy to change, no problems about that. So what I'm giving, I'm just running the application I'm, uh, and I'm looking at the application for one day or two. And I'm just looking, is the CPU go going high? No, is the RAM going high? No. Okay, then slash by two the numbers. I'm going down till the application starts to die. The moment it dies, I'm just increasing to the previous value that was working. And I'm just saying with this till it will it won't die again. What's interesting with Kubernetes is very is the following fact: if your application will die, the Kubernetes will bring it back. So that's why I don't care. And uh, even uh, with front-end applications in particular, if Nginx is dying, the bootstrap speed is uh, uh, 15 or 20 milliseconds, which is almost instant bootstrap. Your uh, user uh, your users will never uh, observe that. So uh, this way you can do. In Java is different because in Java it can take you to drink a coffee, but you cannot send a coffee to every customer, right? So you you need to uh, you need to check first. You need to optimize your uh, compiler and whatnot. Here it's nginx, very simple. That's why I'll, I'll look for it and I'll adapt depending on the user. But I'm always always using. A APM system that is giving me the stats about the system. That's that's very important. And then I'm adjusting the according to that. And what you're saying is very important. If in Kubernetes you are just putting random numbers, high numbers, you risk to exhaust the resources of Kubernetes, and just your team next to you will not be able to deploy their things because there are not enough resources. Voila. So uh, be careful with the resources. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And uh, another info I just checked on the internet. Uh, the first slide we were talking about uh, the Docker, right? Uh, so in from the version 1.20, um, I guess they're gonna move it, uh, replace Docker with the container runtime interface. Um, yes. Yeah. 
so maybe probably because docker is not based on cr open um, oci not oci the kantana runtime see, see 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 they use the same uh, standard for the images what docker does not have i mean it didn't have for a while it was a uh, developer friendly e interface they had a cli that had a lot of text and very verbose so what people had to do it's called what's called docker shim that's a uh, overlay over Docker that used the human readable console output transformed into programmatical output, JSON, whatnot. And this way Kubernetes was talking to Docker, which is uh, nasty because it's not practical. And uh, now uh, Docker, they changed that eventually, but it was too late because the Kubernetes already announced we are going to a standard. So just like OCI is a standard, we are going to use a standard runtime. And by default, uh, the most popular runtimes that I see today these are cryo, it's CRI-IO, and then, uh, and then you have um, Podman from Red Hat. These are the most uh, common things that I saw so far. So, uh, yeah, indeed, it's not Docker. That's why I said that uh, just using icons because everybody knows. Them. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. You, one moment. We are recording these videos, if you can, yeah. Um, yes. So uh, for your service setup, you um, you can specify the number of replicas, and I think Kubernetes has like a load balancer. Um, would you advise it in this setup? Because um, that does, for example, the the Kubernetes load balancer also have like sticky sessions uh, if you need that for your application? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can we can go for uh, multiple replicas. Absolutely, it's absolutely not a problem. And I can advise uh, using replicas. For front-end applications, I will not go with many replicas. However, there is uh, something that's called affinity in Kubernetes, meaning that you can say you can have. Um, let's go quickly to the slide. Previously, pre no, 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 no. Oh, okay. So let's look at this slide. Let's imagine that this server runs in Luxembourg, and other two servers are running in Netherlands. Okay. So what you can say to Kubernetes. I want a replica of two or three instances, and with the affinity mode, you can say, I want one instance in Luxembourg and one instance pre precisely in Netherlands, even if, of the, if part of the same cluster. In this way, your Dutch customers through DNS will be redirected to the local instances and the others to, this, uh, to the Luxembourgish instances. So you'll, have, you'll speed up the access to your application to your app. So yes, but it's rarely used. Okay. Can can you please use the microphone? Yeah, sure. this should remain for uh, history. It depends, of, of course, about your rollout strategy. Whatever you try to do, rolling upgrades, uh, canary deployments, blue green deployments, or whatever deployment strategy. I mean, nice feature was not presented that you can check. Uh, you've got the health probes at the end, so that's in the deployment. But uh, I'm speaking right now that you can put replica free and tell the Kubernetes that always 25% of your deployment have to be available. And on top of that, uh, spin up, and the Kubernetes will automatically spin pod by pod, restarting and ensure the availability over the platform. So that yeah. makes sense. I, I'll give you, absolutely, I'll give you an example. What can go wrong? Because you are bringing a very good point. Uh, so when we are creating the Docker file, we are uh, giving to our Nginx as well a configuration. What's funny with Nginx is that it won't bootstrap if the configuration is wrong, which is normal, uh, by the way. So if you are messing up with this configuration, whenever you are deploying your new version, it will not bootstrap. So not bootstrapping, your application can actually die forever, okay, for the customer. So it will be a constant restart. So what uh, you are saying, uh, the colleague was saying, it's really good idea whenever you are doing, you can have replicas, you can have this, uh, uh, you can have this uh, idea of uh, uh, different strategy, upgrade strategies, and you can use what's called the liveness probe to make sure that your application is actually up and running. If, if Nginx in this particular case is Nginx, will not be able to bootstrap because wrong configuration, this liveness probe will give you not 200. And if you are Java developer, you've got the readiness probe. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, 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 yes. You're right, you're right. <laughs> yeah.
Yes, I, I honestly, I added all of them. But then I said it's, it's too much. I have, uh, but it was it wasn't 51 lines. It was like more. But yeah, I tried to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, you have to give it. Uh, you you need to put checks. So you see what's interesting with Kubernetes you, is that even if you do mistakes during deployment, configuration code, whatever, you still have safety mechanisms embedded. Obviously, you have to use them because they're not for free, but um, you have them there. Any other question? Remark? No? OK, cool. So then um, let's go to the last slide. Da, 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 da. Right, so we have a big QR code. Uh, apparently, I heard recently that it's called QR code. So um, uh, we have uh, little elephants, PHP elephants, but you know, from our sponsor, they are pretty funny. So uh, if uh, you like elephants, you like nature, especially PHP elephants. Uh, please uh, feel free to grab um, grab some. Please join the Discord Luxembourg GS. It was a dream of mine to have um, some sort of a chat where you can go into and ask uh, people around you about uh, some help. For example, like uh, Nicola, I'm going to these standalone components and usually how people are talking, you know, in Teams. Oh, I'm trying this new feature. Oh, it's shit. And you're like, did you read the, the documentation? Oh, come on, who is reading the documentation, right? <laughs> I'm reading it as well. Because, uh, you know, um, from other side, five min uh, two hours of debugging can always save you five minutes of reading the documentation. So uh, please join the Discord. We'll be there. You can share photos, but only um, legal ones. Um, exchange messages and uh, see you online. But before seeing you online, we'll see you there for a drink and for questions and mingle if ever uh, you can stay a little bit more. We have the time till uh, 2030, so we have uh, almost one hour and then we have to go. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our sponsors, Byborg, and see you on the next session. Yeah, just want to say a big thank you to our technical support today from Byborg. Guys, you're amazing. Uh, I saw it uh, already second time how you do it. <laughs> it's really uh, uh, cool. So, guys, yes, Discord, about Discord. So, we just created it. Yeah, I will then share in all our previous chats about this in Twitter, of course. So, Twitter, usually, it's the like, official uh, way of uh, announce things and meetups.com. I think you already know about this group. Discord will be more about different chatting questions. Also, maybe because we have channels there, so we will create more and we will put uh, rules of community there as well about respect others and etc. So uh, we just uh, created it and uh, we will fill it. Uh, and uh, yes, you can share all your thoughts. Maybe even uh, we already created a channel for hiring. So if some of you needs a colleague in your company or you are searching for the team, you can write it in special channel. So no problems with that. And uh, yes, so thank you. Uh, so thanks for our speakers, for your talks. Cool. And guys, you it's not necessary to prepare such a long talk. So if you want to start, start with 15 minutes talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, we can help you just come for uh, to us with ideas and we can help you to to present it. And then we will have record after this and you will be on YouTube and this you can present to someone that it's your work. So it, it really helps with with the work. For example, if you want to become a Google developer expert, you need this. So I never had my list of talks before I applied for this um, for GDE. And then they ask me, no, you need to prepare the whole list of all your talks. And now I have it. So, uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, let's go uh, with funny part. <laughs>